so there are three of us uh, involved today. Um, I'm in Cambridge, as I mentioned. Our main speaker is Professor Hitoshi Oshitani, who is joining us from Tokyo. Um, and I hope that we're going to uh, have also Professor Eric Brunner chairing, and he's in London. So uh, Professor Hitoshi Oshitani is Professor of Virology at Tohoku University. Um, he was previously a regional advisor for the World Health Organization in Manila uh, from 1999 to 2005, uh, responsible for diseases including SARS, avian and pandemic influenza. Uh, and before that, he worked for JICA uh, in Zambia um, from 1991 to 94. Um, and his research is on infectious disease, uh, not only in Japan, but also other countries. And he is uh, very importantly, a member of the advisory committee on the COVID-19 response in Japan. And Professor Eric Brenner, who's going to be chairing this, uh, is Professor of Social and Biological Epidemiology at UCL. Um, and he covers a wide uh, variety of, of health areas, including health inequalities, aging and public health. He also wrote this book, which happens to be uh, on my table here in Cambridge, which we launched uh, uh, earlier this year, Health in Japan, Social Epidemiology of Japan since the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. Um, right, I will leave it at that in terms of the introductions. Um, so we have uh, the timeline is about half an hour from Professor Oshitani. Um, then uh, there'll be some questions and comments from Professor Brunner, and then we'll move to a Q&A session, which I'll chair. So over to you, Professor Oshitani. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jason, for the introduction. It's my great pleasure at this seminar the hosted by Daiwangro Japanese Foundation. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Japan's response uh, to the COVID-19. And, uh, okay, so, as, uh, as Jason uh, introduced, uh, uh, I've been involved in uh, various uh, emerging disease responses in the past the, uh, from uh, the different perspective. The, I was in WHO during SARS and the highly pathogenic avian influenza. And uh, also the, I was in uh, Mongolia, Philippines and some other countries uh, during pandemic in 2009 and uh, Ebola disease outbreak in West Africa. The, so the, the first information on COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan was posted on WHO website on January 5th. And the first re situation report was posted on the WHO website on uh, the, the January 21st. By that time, the, we knew that uh, the, the causative agent for COVID-19 the, was uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2, the, the the, the coronavirus, the closely associated with uh, the causative agent of SARS in 2003. And uh, the National Institute of Infectious Disease in Tokyo, they, they developed uh, their own the PCR system the, by mid January. And uh, as you probably know, the our PCR capacity was quite limited due to several the, the reasons. But uh, we have a quite good uh, public health network in Japan and each prefecture and uh, most of large cities have their own public health laboratories, the, which are the, the part of the national public health the laboratory network. And the National Institute for Infectious Disease, the, the distributed the, the PCR reagent to these, the public health laboratories. And um, initially, the, the very first case the, of COVID-19 in Japan was identified on January 15th last year. And uh, in the, the traveler from Wuhan, China. And the, between the mid-January to the, the early February, the we had the several sporadic cases. The, the most of them are imported cases from Wuhan or the associated with the traveler from Wuhan. But the, all of a sudden, 
the from the 13th of February, they, we started the detecting locally acquired cases in the different prefectures. But the, the, the mainly in Hokkaido, the Hokkaido is a, the prefecture in the northern part of Japan. And there is a famous snow festival in Sapporo in Hokkaido in early February. The, probably this outbreak was started the, from the traveler from the tourist from China. And then the spread to different the, the places in Hokkaido. The Hokkaido is a, the, the quite big prefecture, actually the big, largest prefecture in Japan in terms of uh, the area. And uh, there are many the remote areas, but uh, even in these remote areas, the, the COVID-19 the, was diagnosed by the physician. And uh, this the, illustrate the, the, our good access to healthcare, even in uh, these remote areas, the, the, we managed to the diagnose these cases the early last year. And actually, the, our very first outbreak was almost controlled the, by mid-March last year. So this outbreak was triggered by the imported case from China. But the, all of a sudden, we are we saw the increasing trend of the cases that triggered by the imported cases from other countries like the US, UK, the France, and some other European countries, Egypt, and uh, the Southeast Asia, and so on. And then the, we had the, the very first, the, the outbreak of COVID-19, large outbreak of COVID-19 in Japan, in, starting from end of the March last year. And by that time, we knew that the, the COVID-19 outbreak was almost controlled in China. And uh, also in Singapore, they tested many, many suspected cases. And I was actually in Singapore uh, in early February to discuss the, the COVID-19 response in uh, uh, with the Minister of Health people in Singapore. But uh, in Japan, the, as I mentioned, uh, we had a quite limited the PCR capacity. And also we do not have a legal system to implement lockdown measures in, like China. So the, we set a different objective for COVID-19 response in Japan. The, by end of February last year, we set this objective. The, to maintain social and economic activities as much as possible while suppressing the COVID-19 transmission as much as possible. So we set this objective and the, our objective has not been changed. And uh, actually we did not aim at containment the, from the beginning. And we are trying to suppress the transmission as much as possible. And uh, I was involved in the SARS response in 2003 and I've been the thinking the what are similarities and what are differences between SARS and COVID-19. And both of them are caused by the quite the closely related the viruses, SARS-CoV-2 and the SARS-CoV-2. And both of them the, started from southern part of China. In Guangdong province, the, the, in December 2002, and uh, and the Wuhan, the city, the probably in December uh, 2019, and uh, but uh, also the 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 both for both of them, SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, the probably the natural reservoir are apart, and uh, the for SARS intermediate host was probably the Tibet cat. But uh, we do still do not know how the, the SARS-CoV-2 emerged in the human population, and uh, but uh, the, there is the significant difference between SARS and COVID-19. The SARS spread to many countries, including Vietnam, Singapore, the Canada, and some other countries. But uh, most of the global spread uh, was initiated by 
single patient uh, from Guangdong province. And but it, he they travel by bus to the Hong to, to from Guangdong to Hong Kong. Then he stayed at this hotel the, in Hong Kong. The, he actually stayed at the room 911 on the ninth floor of this hotel. And then the, the other guests the, on the same floor, on the, on the ninth floor, were infected. And they, the, they brought the virus back to, their, the, to different countries. But for COVID-19, the, it, it was spread from Wuhan and some other the cities in China the, to many countries the, by the direct the, the, the fright. And the consequences are quite different. The, for SARS, the, we had the 8,096 the cases with 774 deaths. And the SARS was successfully contained the, by the, the 5th of July, 2003. But the, for COVID-19, we already had more than 170 million cases with 3.8 million deaths. And there is still no sign of control for COVID-19 and the pandemic still continue. So there, there are some significant differences in terms of the clinical pictures and the epidemiology that between SARS and COVID-19. So this difference is the, due to several reasons, but several factors. But the most important factor is the clinical severity. For SARS, the most of infected individuals develop very severe symptoms. And that's why the case fatality ratio was quite high, about 10%. But the, since the, most of them develop typical severe clinical symptoms, we managed to identify the most of the cases. And we also managed to identify the most chain of transmission. And uh, then the, we managed to interrupt all chain of transmission. That's the definition of containment. But for SARS, there are many mild cases and they even many, many asymptomatic cases. And these mild and the possibly asymptomatic cases are also involved in a chain of transmission. And this makes this COVID-19 very, very difficult to control. And uh, so this, invisible nature of this virus to make this virus uh, very difficult to control. And uh, so it's very difficult to identify all possible cases. And all of a sudden, uh, the, we see the, the clusters in the different places or the, the unlinked, the isolated cases the, without the known the exposure to confirmed cases. And also another the important difference between SARS and COVID-19 is the timing of infectivity. For SARS, the, the infected individual do not have any infectivity. The, that means uh, the ability to infect others. The, the during the early stage of illness, and only when they develop the very severe symptom, they have uh, the infectivity. So that's why the, we can the contain or control SARS by isolating the old patient after the onset of illness. But for COVID-19, we know that uh, the infectivity peaked be even before the onset of illness. For this kind of disease, it's extremely difficult to control because even if we, we isolate all cases after the onset, it's too late. It probably he or she may have already spread the virus to others. And we knew that uh, the, the very important epidemiological characteristics of COVID-19 from the early stage of uh, the outbreak, the by mid-February last year, the Professor Hiroshi Nishiura's group had this the preliminary data that indicated that the most of the infected individual uh, did not pass the virus to anybody else. They have, the very small proportion of cases infect many others and the forming the super spreading event or the, the large clusters. So this is a, the, we, found, we knew that uh, this is a quite important 
characteristics of the COVID-19. And so these are the possible mechanisms for the large outbreak of COVID-19, the chain of clusters, the cluster that can the, cause the, another cluster, the, more, the, the very big clusters the, that we've been seeing in such the big clusters in the different the parts of the world. And uh, these are the, the condition for the large outbreak of COVID-19 to occur. And also the, we've been using the quite the unique approach for contact tracing. In most of countries, the, the, they are just doing the so-called prospective contact tracing. When you identify the confirmed cases, the, you follow the, the contact and the, to see if there is any the symptomatic or the positive the, the, the cases among the, the close contact. But in addition to the, this prospective contact tracing, we've been doing a so-called retrospective contact tracing or backward contact tracing to identify the common source of infection. As I mentioned, the, the COVID-19, the transmission of COVID-19 can only be maintained the, by forming the clusters or super spreading event. So there must be uh, some, the, the cluster. So we've been trying to, they identify the common source of the cross, uh, common source of infection for the, the confirmed cases. And the public health nurses in the public health centers, we have uh, over 400 public health centers and uh, over 8,000 public trained the public health nurses working in these public health centers. They, they've been asking the, the past activities the, in last 14 days or so and to identify the common source of infection for the different cases. By the doing uh, this meticulous the contact tracing, the including the retrospective contact tracing, the, in the early the phase of outbreak last year, we managed to identify the, the many, many clusters. So this is one of the example, the, the clusters in the live music, the clubs in Osaka, and uh, we identify the clusters in the different uh, live music clubs, small live music clubs, and uh, the, the family clusters and uh, associated with uh, these the cases. And um, we managed to the, the identify such the transmission chains the, in many cases in the early stage of uh, the outbreak last year. And we, we also found the common characteristic in which the most clusters were occurring. So this, these common characteristics are now known as the three Cs or summits in Japanese, the closed space, the crowded places, and the close contact setting, the, such as a close range conversation. So these are the, the important characteristic in which the most clusters the, are occurring. And uh, by identifying the, these common characteristics, that we managed to send the more effective public health message to the general public to avoid such the risky environment. And the further analysis of cluster identified the, some other the risk factors like a singing, exercise, and uh, also the nightlife settings. And uh, so we found many clusters in. The, the place like a bath, karaoke, and so on. And uh, we also the identify that uh, the more than 40% of the cluster were caused by those in pre-symptomatic period. So this makes, as I mentioned, this makes the COVID-19 control very difficult. And many of uh, the index case for the clusters are relatively young people. And uh, the, as I mentioned, uh, we had uh, the first outbreak, large outbreak uh, from the, the mid-March last year. And the first state of emergency was declared by the government on 7th of April last year. And the number of cases decreased. But uh, the, after that, the, 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 since the mid the June last year, the number of cases the again increased. And we had a second wave of outbreak in summer last year. And the, this uh, summer outbreak the, was started from the restaurants and the bars 
the, the particularly in the host and hostess crowds in the large, very large, the nightlife entertainment area in Tokyo. And uh, so in this outbreak, the majority of cases, the infected people were the, the young people in their 20s and 30s. And um, this makes the, the control of COVID-19 in this phase very difficult because uh, the, the people who visited the host and hostess club uh, usually do not tell the truth. And also, the since majority of infected individuals were relatively young, and uh, they tend to develop the less severe illness or even as symptomatic the, the infection. So this also the makes the, the contact tracing the, the quite difficult in this phase. So this is a diagram to show the, the how the, the COVID-19 spread in this phase. The, it started from a large night life entertainment areas. And uh, then the, the virus spread into the, the household, the schools, hospitals, workplaces, and so on. And uh, the, the, this is actually the second wave in summer last year. And we had a much large outbreak uh, in winter. The, and starting from the end of the November last year, and the second the state of emergency was declared on 7th of January. And uh, after that, uh, the, the number of ca the cases still increased. And uh, we are now in the middle of third state of emergency, but uh, the government decided to the, remove all areas from the state of emergency, except for the, the Okinawa in the southern, the, the island prefecture uh, from Monday next year, next week. And this is the number of the confirmed cases by prefecture. Actually, the, the most cases that have been occurring in large metropolitan areas like Tokyo and Osaka. And uh, about the more than 20% the of cases occurred in the Tokyo. And in smaller prefectures, the number of cases, the number of cases, numbers of cases are much smaller than metropolitan areas. And actually the, the, the cases per the 1000 population is much smaller. So the, our, the, we believe that the, our, the, the cluster-based approach the, is the, the working well the, in the, these small the prefectures except for Okinawa. The, the Okinawa had a very the high incidence rate the, because of uh, the many tourists the, from metropolitan areas like Tokyo and Osaka. And this uh, the slide the show that the, the proportion of uh, the different prefectures the, among the, all the confirmed cases, the red is Tokyo. As you can see, the majority of cases have been occurring in Tokyo and the surrounding area. And the, the the blue is Osaka, and Osaka also the they had a higher proportion of cases, and so the our challenge is uh, how to control the COVID nineteen in such the the big cities, and uh, the government they declared this the state of emergency for three times, the but the, our state of emergency is different from lockdown in other countries. The, we do not have a legal enforcement power to implement the, any lockdown type of measures. The, even the, the government declared a state of emergency, we they basically ask people to change their behavior, to avoid the risky environment. But um, the actually people are changing be their behavior even before the, the government declared the state of emergency. The, this, uh, the, the data in Osaka the, this year, they illustrated the, the, the such, the, the voluntary the behavior change. The, even before the, the government declared the state of emergency, number of cases the, by presumed date of onset decreased. The, this is probably because people saw the, 
the increasing trend of the reported cases, then the people change the behavior for the people the uh, saw the news that saying that uh, the the hospitals are completely overwhelmed then they changed their behavior so that's how the the our covid-19 the was also the 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 controlled even in the large metropolitan areas so the, this is the 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 mortality impact of covid-19 in the different countries the, it's the, the very busy slide, but the, the Japan is somewhere here. The, and the, the mortality impact the, is much smaller than the Europe and the North America. And this is the number of confirmed cases in the past seven days per uh, 100,000 people uh, in the UK and the Japan. Also, the incidence the, is quite different. The, we managed to the suppress the transmission the, compared to the, the European countries and other countries. And our approach, the, the cluster-based approach, is the, the recognized by the, the some researchers. And the, this, the, the science, the magazine, the, the article the illustrated the, exactly the, what we are doing. Uh, in Japan uh, as a cluster-based approach. And I understand the US CDC is now recommending to do the, the retrospective contact tracing. And the 3Cs concept uh, is recognized by WHO, the particular WHO Western Pacific Regional Office. So the, in the last five minutes or so, the, I'm going to talk about uh, the large the mass gathering event in Tokyo in the coming weeks. In, and um, so mass gathering, the, obviously it's uh, Olympic and the Paralympic, but the mass gathering is associated with the risk of uh, the COVID-19 transmission. And uh, today, Dr. Omi, chair of uh, the, our expert panel, the, presented the, our risk assessment framework the, to organizing committee. And we are very much the concern the, about the spread of the virus the, during and after the Olympic. And uh, this is uh, the COVID-19 situation in uh, different countries uh, as of last week. And uh, the, as you probably know, number of cases are increasing the, in some countries, especially in those in the Southern Hemisphere. The Southern Hemisphere is going into the winter and uh, the, there are sharp increase in some the case, some countries like uh, the Southern African countries. And uh, also in some Asian countries, we are, they, they are seeing the, the significant increase in terms of the number of the cases. So we are very much concerned about uh, the, these the countries and uh, the Olympic is uh, definitely the global event. And uh, the people from these countries are also coming to Japan. And uh, in many of these countries, especially the countries in Africa, do not have uh, the access to the vaccines. Even healthcare workers are not fully vaccinated in many countries. And uh, so the, the now the rich countries have uh, enough vaccines but there are still many countries do not have access to the, the vaccines. And, uh, so, and also the, the Japan is somewhere here. Uh, this is uh, the number of uh, the reported cases per the 100,000 population the, the, as of last year. And uh, there are many countries the which have much higher incidence than Japan right now. And also we have many countries with the still very low incidence. The, the some of the, or many of these countries are resource limited countries and we should not make Olympic or Paralympic the event to spread the virus to these countries. And uh, so now the story is more complicated uh, with the uh, emergence of uh, different variants, uh, including alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And uh, so now 
the most of circulating strain in Japan the, it are the alpha variant the originated from UK. And, uh, but the, the, the Delta variant the originated from India is now increasing in Japan. So, and also the particularly in Tokyo, the situation is not that good. And uh, so the, the, we agreed to remove Tokyo from the state of emergency the, at the meeting the yesterday, but uh, we are very much the concern about the situation in Tokyo. So now the level is quite high the, by our standard. And uh, we are still seeing the over 400 cases every day in Tokyo. And uh, the number of cases the, can increase anytime the, from now. The particularly with this, uh, the, the, the Delta variant, the, the, the proportion of the Delta variant in Tokyo and the surrounding areas uh, is increasing. And uh, the, we are still not sure the, the how much the, in, the increased the infectivity this variant has, but uh, the, the, according to the preliminary data from the UK suggested that the increasing infectivity of this variant. So the, if the, the, this variant, without, even without the Delta variant, the, we may see the, the large outbreak the, by opening ceremony of Olympic. And uh, we just presented this uh, the projection the, 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 with uh, Yuki Furuse the, of the Kyoto University. And uh, even without the, the Delta variant effect, the, we may see the increasing the number of cases the, by Olympic. Uh, because uh, the state, the Tokyo, the, will also be removed from the state of emergency from Monday next week, and uh, with the the moderate effect of the Delta, Delta variant, we will see the significant increase in terms of number the by end of the July. So the opening ceremony of Olympic is planned on twenty third of the July. So by that time we may need to declare another state of emergency. And so the further information that we created this website and we posted some the information on the Japanese response to the COVID-19. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much. Um, Eric, would you like to take up the discussion at this point? Thank you, Jason. And thank you very much, Dr. Oshitani for a really um, fantastically clear and up-to-date presentation from a member of the Japanese Expert Committee. Now, from, from my perspective as an epidemiologist um, in the West, um, Japan continues to provide examples of um, fantastic population health, and COVID-19 uh, seems to be part of that picture. So I want to start by asking you to um, unpack, to, to explain perhaps the, the, the very specific aspects of behavior which you, which you mentioned, which um, may explain the low rate of cases in Japan compared to um, Western countries. Um, so I, th I thought we'd, we'd first of all talk about cases and you, you've, you know, th this seems to be an East Asian phenomenon as much as a Japanese one. For example, South Korea um, also has very low um, infection rates. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bruna, for your question. The, um, the, our, as I mentioned in the presentation, we do not have uh, the law enforcement power to implement lockdown or the, the aggressive measure. 
and uh, we are also not allowed to use uh, the some the data the, with some privacy concern. The, we cannot use uh, the mobile phone the GPS data, uh, for example. But uh, so we the basically rely on the people's the the voluntary the behavior change, and. Um, so it's getting difficult for the people to change the behavior. The initially, the people are more worried about COVID-19, uh, but the, especially among young people, the, it's, the, it's a big challenge for us to the change their behavior. But uh, the, so far, the, when the, we have uh, the increasing trend of cases and uh, especially the increasing trend of severe cases in hospital, the, the people usually change their behavior. And uh, we have uh, the, our society, in our Japanese society, the, we have a very strong peer pressure and uh, which may explain the, such behavior change, the, the particularly in Japan. Yeah, so um, the it, it's clear that it's clear that the Japanese people are uh, as a as a as a nation respond to the data. Mm -hmm. So they're responding to the pattern of the epidemic. Is it also possible that Japan is somehow sensitized to the dangers of, of epidemics? through the SARS epidemic that you referred to um, 18 years ago and, and other things, um, uh, you know, just trying to understand yeah. the, the station <clears throat> context. The, actually, we did not have any confirmed SARS cases in Japan. The, in some other Asian countries like uh, the Singapore, China, and also the Taiwan and Hong Kong, the, they had uh, the, the severe the effect of uh, or the outbreak of SARS in 2003. And the, the, the people changed their, the, their mindset after SARS in 2003, but that did not happen in Japan. Also in South Korea, that they had uh, the mass the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome outbreak in 2015, and uh, which the, the made them change their legal system, but uh, we did not have a, such the major outbreak in the past 20 years. Okay, so um, mo moving, moving on to um, the issue of the death rate, um, the, the, the difference um, really, really is quite remarkable. So Japan, which has a population exactly double that of the UK, um, you, you have 14,000 COVID-linked deaths, um, whereas in the UK, it's 128,000. So there, there is a really remarkable um, difference it's 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 you know more than one order of magnitude on the log scale um i i'm, I'm not sure that I, I guess one question is do the japanese recognize how well they're dealing with the covid19 epidemic in relative terms the in terms of the difference uh, the, of uh, mortality impact or death rate, the, the basically we have uh, the much lower incidence than in UK. The, we managed to suppress the transmission the, in the every waves of outbreaks. The, the, that's the, one of the reasons and also the, the, there, there is some the disparity in terms of the access to the healthcare, but uh, the, the, we still have uh, the, the relatively, the, 
the access to the relatively good the health care the almost everywhere in Japan. And, uh, and also the, our clinicians network the exchange different information to improve the, the, the treatment. And uh, so the, that's also the, the, our the medical doctor, the, the, the exchange the information uh, among themselves and to improve the, the outcome of uh, the COVID-19. And uh, so the, the good access to healthcare uh, is probably the, one of the important factors. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that takes us to the issue of data on hospitalization and um, the uh, case fatality rate. And um, I want to share this um, slide, um, which, which shows um, the, the national UK um, data on hospitalization. I hope people can see my screen. Um, Yeah, can you see? Can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, um, it's, it's so. My question, um, Dr. Oshitani, is there data on the case fatality rates, and is there is there a, a system um, emerging a, a national system for reporting um, data such as this, which shows uh, the number of patients with a particular with COVID in hospital? The, we have several systems uh, that we are monitoring the number of uh, hospitalization, the, especially the number of the, the patient in ICU or uh, on a ventilation. And uh, it is posted on uh, the Minister of Health, Labor and Welfare website every day. And um, also, the, the some professional networks uh, are collecting the, some more data. I see. Okay. So, um, so let, let's move on to a question which everyone, I'm sure, is interested in, which is, which is vaccination. And um, I wonder whether you could give us um, a brief um, update here. So what we can see is that um, the vaccination rate is is ramping up very rapidly in Japan, but it stands at about 16% compared to 60% in the UK. So the, in terms of the vaccine rollout, the, it's true that uh, we are slower. The, the, the first challenge was the procurement of the vaccine. Uh, we, the, the, the several the pharmaceutical companies in Japan are trying to develop uh, the, their own vaccines, but uh, the right now, the only available vaccines are the imported vaccines. And uh, it took some time to, for the government to procure the vaccines. And uh, it also took some time the, to the, the license vaccines. And uh, we are relatively more cautious in implementing the, the vaccination program. The, because uh, the, our, the, we always have to the balance between the risk and the benefit the, in implementing the, the, these kind of uh, the interventions. And uh, the, due to the relatively low mortality impact compared to other countries, the, we are a bit cautious uh, in implementing the, the vaccination program. They especially, the, as you probably know, we are very sensitive to the, any adverse event. The, the actually, the, we still cannot the, the give the human papilloma the vaccine to the young girls uh, because of the concern of, about uh, the adverse event. And uh, so the, that's the, another reason why we've been cautious in the rollout of the vaccines. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Oshkutani. We, we now move on to what is, is probably the, one of the most um, interesting um, current 
um, public health issues, which is uh, the decision making process and the expert advice which you and your colleagues have been giving in respect of, of the Olympics. And as you said, the Olympics are a global event. It's very important for the world to understand um, the scientific basis of the um, decisions which are upcoming um, in respect of uh, the Olympics. And I mean, it does seem, first of all, clear that the Olympics are gonna go ahead. Um, and I think everyone has enormous sympathy for, for the Japanese situation and how much they've invested in setting up the second Tokyo Olympics. Um, so the context, the international context, um, is, is shown here where in the United Kingdom, we can see that in the last few weeks, that the number of confirmed cases is taking a very worrying upward trend. And um, of course, we have a much higher vaccination rate. So it means that there has been a considerable decoupling of the case rate from the hospitalization and death rate. Um, in Japan, there's a very contrasting pattern where we can see that the, the number of daily confirmed cases is really going down and has been going down very, very nicely for the last, whatever it is, um, six weeks or so. Um, so obviously there's a much lower vaccination rate, but from, from the outside, for example, we can, we, can look, we can look here that the number of confirmed cases per million is 110 in, uh, in the UK on the 15th of June compared to 13 in Japan. So um, can you see that um, the, the, the debate in Japan is very different from the one that's taking place here where the Euros, the Euro, the football um, is going ahead and um, the stadiums will be allowed 25% capacity with face covering and social distancing and the need to present a negative lateral flow test. So that's a rather, a rather elaborate introduction, but <clears throat> I'll go back to my initial question, which is how, how is the world to understand the Japanese public health debate the first of all uh, as i probably mentioned uh, dr Omi, the chair of the uh, expert uh, panel uh, presented uh, the our disc the the assessment the framework to the organizing committee today and uh, they they had a press conference this evening and uh, the the although number of cases is decreasing in Japan, the, still the 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 level of uh, the COVID nineteen activity is still high, particularly in Tokyo. And as I mentioned, the it's the big challenge to control COVID nineteen in the metropolitan area, especially in Tokyo. And then the in the past outbreaks the past waves, the, the, the virus spread from Tokyo to the all over Japan. So if the, 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 we have the large outbreak during or after the Olympic, the, we may see the large outbreak the, in other prefectures. The, that is our concern. And also the, we are setting the very low threshold to declare the state of emergency or the, some other more aggressive, to implement more aggressive measures. And uh, so 
the compared to UK, the current UK data, the our the the incident seems to be lower, but the still the by using the our standard, it's quite high, the, especially in Tokyo. And uh, we are trying to suppress the transmission at the lower level. Uh, so the the especially the this the coming weeks the the we may see the increasing trend actually the around this time of year the tokyo had only the 30 or 40 cases every day then by end of july the tokyo had more than 300 cases and uh, 10 times higher than mid june last year and uh, we are still not sure the the what seasonality the COVID-19 has, but uh, the, certainly in the winter, we had the, the sharp increase the, in December. And also during summer, the, our summer is quite hot and humid. And uh, most of people are staying indoor with the air conditioning system. So in this kind of setting, the, the virus transmission the, can the occur more frequently during summer. So which is also the, of our concern. And uh, we may see the increasing trend in the coming weeks. Okay, so um, to what extent do you think that the testing rate um, has an impact on these, uh, sci on the scientific advice? Because the, the testing rate does seem to be quite low in relation, for example, to this country. So we are not recommending to test old people. The, the, we are just testing the people with high the probability of uh, positivity. And uh, that's why the, our testing rate is still low, but uh, the, the, even with the, the low testing rate, the, in most of places, we managed to control the COVID-19 the, at the lower level. So the, we believe that it's important to the, the identify the cluster as early as possible. The, so that spread the, of COVID-19 can be minimized. So the, the testing alone, I don't think the testing alone can the, the suppress the COVID-19 transmission effectively. Okay, well, th thank you very much for that. What's, what's very clear is that the, the test and tracing operation in Japan is, um, is, is, a, is a positive model for the world. Um, and, and I think also the, the point that comes through to me is that the public health community in Japan does have very high standards. In other words, as you said, that a much lower threshold for public health concern and public health action. 